Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, I am delighted to be here. My name is uh, Bernard Wolfstorff. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing this esteemed panel of colleagues. Um, firstly, to introduce uh, on my right, Ira Kurzban. Um, I could use the prepared remarks that we have about his many uh, federal uh, cases that he's argued in the Supreme Court. Uh, rather, um, you know, Kurzban is now just an adjective. Um, <laughs> It's not a name anymore. Uh, one of my associates came up to me and said, um, you know Ira Kurzban? And I'm like, yeah, sure. We've been known him for a long time. And suddenly my esteem had been raised uh, considerably, merely by the fact that I happen to know Ira Kurzban. So um, that's his legend. There is not a USCIS adjudicator or trial attorney that doesn't have his book on their desk. Okay, you walk into a USCIS office, this is the Bible, uh, the Torah, the Quran, everything. Uh, it's, uh, it's legendary, and um, that's Ira. Um, he has uh, made an enormous impact uh, in the field of immigration law. Margaret Stock is going to beat up on me later when I mess up the introduction on her, uh, as I usually do. Um, I always call her the Colonel Harvard uh, uh, graduate. Um, inspired by Debbie, um, author of um, the uh, text, um, Immigration Law and the Military. We're very proud in the um, American Immigration Lawyer Association uh, and generally of the amazing work that she's done on behalf of military families. Uh, USCIS, uh, you know, to its credit, now discriminates equally against everybody, military and all. And uh, there's no question Margaret has led the challenge in helping uh, families and spouses of soldiers um, and really has defined on a daily basis, continues to be the source uh, for all of us and has made enormous accomplishments, uh, particularly in the area of um, what we call you know, the little acronyms in immigration law, PIP, PIP, uh, parole in place, where we don't have to, uh, we can adjust um, soldiers uh, in the US uh, and their families to some degree. She's fought hard, and you don't want to get into a fight with Margaret. I can assure you, I have the bruises to prove it. Um, our third speaker, I unfortunately cannot make personal anecdotes about, um, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Professor of Law at Michigan State University, co-founder of the Immigrant Law Clinic there, um, worked in uh, Nepal in the Peace Corps, and uh, was recently um, formerly Associate Dean for Clinical Studies at UNLV, and recently elected to membership in the American Law Institute. Um, I want to tell a little bit about my own story. Um, I know this isn't about me, but uh, I think it speaks volumes about what Debbie and this clinic has accomplished. Um, those of you who haven't figured out my phony English accent yet, um, that's a South African accent. Um, over 30 years ago, I left South Africa um, with one suitcase, um, and arrived in Boston. And um, I was lost. I was afraid. I was scared. Um, two years before I left uh, was the Soweto riots, 1976-77. I was vice president of the National Union of South African Students. Um, it was a tumultuous period. Uh, those of you who are young do not remember when the apartheid military opened up their machine guns on children who were protesting having to study math and science in a third language, Afrikaans, Dutch. Uh, this was a way to perpetuate uh, the suffering of the black people of South Africa. And uh, it was a triggering point. Uh, after they had slaughtered several hundred protesting school kids, 
Um, the picture of Hector Peterson on the front cover of Time magazine stirred the world. A 14-year-old kid dying in his friend's arms. And um, we, uh, at our white universities, uh, we did our little protests. They kind of felt semi-feeble uh, relative to what was going on. And uh, I'll always remember Lieutenant Taylor walking into my office where I was the president of the student body and um, telling me how he had killed Mishludi the week before and with his hand on his revolver told me that getting rid of me would be easy as well. And I retorted with my cheeky attitude that uh, he wouldn't do it, it'd make the papers, uh, which made him snarl. So um, anyway, uh, my little experience was I was teaching law and I was sure that I would get another deferment. Uh, within days, I was required to report uh, to the apartheid military and engage in the slaughter of black civilians in the civil war that was going on. That wasn't a choice for me. I packed my little one bag. I got on a plane. I left everything. I'm not an economic refugee. Life wasn't too bad for us white kids in South Africa at that point. Uh, economically, um, I came here with my $3,000 allowance. I arrived on the shores of Boston. I had no idea where I was going to go. And um, somebody gave me um, Debbie's number. And I arrived in her office. And um, fast forward, two or three months later, my asylum case was approved. The asylum officer described... Uh, the case is the best he had ever seen in the Boston office, which of course is testimony to Debbie's remarkable work, her patience, uh, and uh, her excellent lawyering. So there's no question that what Debbie has done over the years has inspired many other clinics. I don't know if this clinic was the first. It is certainly amongst the first uh, her publishing, uh, her writing, her speaking, her activism in this arena has been remarkable. Um, being a refugee is something we see and we talk about. I can only try and share with you that first six months in the minute that I have left. Um, three months after, this is something that people don't understand the the difficulty of immigrating and leaving your family behind. Three months after I left, my father died. <coughs> and uh, I knew when I left that I would say a final farewell. He wasn't well. And leaving meant uh, saying goodbye permanently. Two months later, and I'm a little mommy's boy if I don't look like one, uh, I lived with mama all the way up till the time I left, and uh, broke her heart when I left. Um, it's kind of cliche to talk of heartbreak, but two months later she got sick and died as well. So I was dazed, I was confused, I was scared, I was terrified, and there was one shining light, this young woman here who uh, saved me in many respects. Now I have four children, I have 20 attorneys working in our firm and a so-called successful practice. Uh, we do some asylum work, SIG cases, refugee cases, um, but, you know, nothing compared to my role model, my peer, uh, my hero, uh, Debbie, and the folks who struggle day in, day out uh, to accomplish um, and help people like me. So... Um, Without further ado, let's uh, get into our program, and uh, Ira, you're up. Okay. Beat you. that one. <laughs> Beautiful. Baby. Thank you. Thank you. What an honor it is uh, to be here uh, to celebrate um, the 30th anniversary of the clinic. And to Debbie, to recognize the wonderful work that Debbie, uh, John, Nancy, 
uh, many of the other people in the clinic have done. I'm sorry, I'm not, not able to name everyone, but um, this clinic has done remarkable work over the last 30 years. And what I wanted to talk about is kind of the beginning. Debbie asked me to, I'm probably one of the few people old enough to do, <laughs> to do it here uh, today. And to talk about uh, how we began doing uh, what they call asylum law. You know, when we started, there was no asylum law. There was no Refugee Act of 1980. Uh, there were no regulations. And the only thing that we had at the very beginning was the uh, Refugee Convention, the Convention uh, and Protocol relating to the status of refugees. And so the world was very, very different then. Uh, this was before uh, refugees, for example, or asylees got work authorization. And one of the first things that we did is to begin to bring lawsuits uh, one after the other on basic issues like whether or not people had the right to work during the time that their applications were pending. And um, uh, I remember uh, at the very beginning, uh, we had a very different view of how to deal with refugee and asylum cases. And I think Debbie will really want me to talk about that. You know, there are many different views on how to do impact litigation. And uh, we were fortunate enough to begin with an organization called the Haitian Refugee Center. The Haitian Refugee Center was initially begun by the uh, Catholic Relief Services. And then the Haitians decided they wanted to run their own organization. And they basically established the Haitian Refugee Center. And they needed a lawyer. And there was no one else around who knew anything about asylum. And I didn't know very much about it either. But we had had uh, the beginnings of a couple of cases, uh, marie Lucy Jean uh, and Marie Sanan, which were the first two cases brought uh, by the National Emergency Civil Liberties Committee. And I was the lawyer for them at the time in Florida. Uh, and the NECLC brought the first action saying that refugees had rights under the convention. So uh, the uh, Haitian community basically uh, turned to me to try to help out. And uh, uh, we began uh, by analyzing the problems that individuals had. In other words, it wasn't where uh, we kind of thought of these great issues. It was that the issues really uh, emanated from the clients themselves. We used to have hundreds and hundreds of Haitian refugees coming into the uh, Haitian Refugee Center, and they all had a variety of problems, you know, as the clinic, I'm sure, it does today. Uh, and those problems turned on how they were going to get representation. Uh, these were people coming off of boats. Many of their family members were in detention. And the one lasting, searing memory I have, and, uh, you know, these stories are incredible, as Bernie's story is, you know, Bernie is one of our preeminent immigration lawyers in the country, and to go from where he was to where he is today is just a remarkable story. But I remember one day being, uh, being asked to go and visit a 12-year-old girl who was in detention, um, uh, and unheard of in a day in actually the Dade County Jail. Uh, she was not in detention the way we uh, have children sometimes in detention today. She was just sitting in a jail alone um, and she was there for three weeks. Um, and that was kind of the turning point for me realizing that this is something I need to spend a good deal of my life working on which was the idea of helping people who were, you know, completely defenseless. And um, we began these cases. That was one of the cases. I, obviously, we got her out of jail right away. Um, but there were many, many different circumstances. And these cases eventually led to uh, a number and series of class actions. And one of those was Jean V. Nelson. And that really arose out of the... Um, uh, the decision by the uh, Reagan administration to detain, interdict, uh, and deport Haitians as rapidly as possible. So we went into court, and I have to tell you, you know, there's always myths created around all of these things about, 
for example, all the work I did. The, the gentleman sitting in the very back there, uh, Robert, you see him? Uh, he's actually responsible for most of the cases that I get a lot of credit for. Uh, and his firm, and I'll tell you one of those stories, I remember in front of Judge Spellman, uh, he said uh, the government filed a motion to dismiss and, you know, when can you file a response? And I'd say, oh, Judge, 24 hours, no problem. And he'd look at me like, okay, so you mean Mr. Juseem's firm's going to file a response? And I said, yes, of course. Um, so we were very fortunate uh, with the help of Freed Frank on a number of these cases. Uh, and I think that also set a model uh, on what many um, uh, organizations do today, uh, and I'm sure the clinic has at times, but other clinics as well, which is to partner with um, uh, law firms who are willing to do this kind of work. And uh, over the years, we were able to bring uh, about 13 class action lawsuits uh, and those lawsuits range from establishing the right to work. We established the first regulations involving the right to work for asylum. Um, uh, obviously, in Jean V. Nelson, we established the principle of non-discrimination. Uh, and, uh, and, and it went on. HRC v. Uh, uh, Eddy was another case in which we worked on. So we, we were quite fortunate in, in having assistance along the way, but the model was always ask the clients what they want, not to kind of go out and you know, bring these theoretical lawsuits. So um, in, in the end, I think uh, we achieve much. Um, but I, to, as the final story, I will tell you, you know, help comes in lots of different ways. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, Jean V. Nelson at one point went on banc uh, in the 11th Circuit, and that was not a good sign. Um, I was only a lawyer practicing a few years, and I tell all the lawyers in my office who are practicing two years or three years, you know, you can go out and argue these cases. I mean, don't be afraid. I didn't know what I was doing, and I went and argued them, and some of them came out okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I remember uh, Debbie uh, came to my aid uh, right before I was arguing Jean V. Nelson. And, um, you know, assistance comes in lots of different ways. And Debbie came to my hotel room with a big pint of Hagen dazs ice cream. <laughs> so if those of you who know me know that there's nothing more important to me in the world than, than having Hagen dazs ice cream. So, that, you know, Debbie and I sat and talked about the case for about three hours over a big pint of haagen ice cream, and I got up there the next day, I made a great argument, and of course we lost, but, uh, but, but at least I had a good time doing it. So thank you, Debbie, thanks the clinic, John, Nancy, everyone else in the clinic, thank you all for the great work you're doing, keep doing it. Obviously we need it, uh, and uh, it, you know, it's not gonna end, uh, this fight is a long uh, and continuous fight, so. Thank you all. Wow, my turn. One of the most exciting things in my career ever was getting a case cited in Kurzban. You know that. <laughs> and I had no idea what I was doing in that case either, but it ended up in Kurzban. Um, it, it's very exciting to be here. This is actually the first time I've been in this building because I graduated in 1992, and this building didn't exist, I don't think, uh, back then. It's certainly much prettier than uh, the buildings I recall. Good work, Dean. No. Been for so <laughs> I, I think you're, you've been asking me to help you, help you pay it, but no. Um, <laughs> and everyone else here, one of the great joys of graduating, right? You pay up, even it's going to take a long time. Right, you pay off the loans and then you get their formal follow-on requests, right? Okay. Well, I thought I'd start with, um, we're here at Harvard Law School, so I thought I'd start with a famous saying from Aristotle, law is reason free from passion. Uh, I think most people in the room are very familiar with this saying because it was made quite famous in the very important Harvard Law School movie, <laughs> Legally Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of course, Aristotle meant when he, he said this that law is supposed to be about logical rules for the ordering of society and so forth, but I've been practicing in the area of immigration law for more than 20 years now, and I can tell you that 
Immigration law is exactly the opposite <clears throat> of what Aristotle said. Immigration law is passion free from reason. <laughs> uh, now, I was a student, as I mentioned, uh, back when uh, Harvard, the, the clinic here, was actually located at uh, Cambridge and Somerville Legal Services, and I had to trek from the campus with my big backpack full of heavy immigration books up there to work on cases. Uh, Deb Yanker was teaching the classroom component, and Nancy Kelly and John, you were out there at the clinic supervising me, and Debbie was also supervising me, and I remember this quite well. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I think most law students don't. Uh, but Debbie and Nancy always brought both passion and reason to the practice of immigration law. And John, don't want to let you out. You were more reasonable than, than the passion side, though, I think. Uh, <laughs> still got that, right? Um, and in fact, both of these characteristics are necessary if you're going to practice in the area of immigration law today. Uh, the success of the clinic, I think, derives in large part from the fact that it does inculcate a passion for immigration law in the students who participate in the clinic along with the practical knowledge of the rules. And all of us here in the room know how difficult the field of immigration law is. This is kind of in our face every day of the week. We have famous sayings that we point to from federal courts. One of the federal courts most famously said, it's King Minos's labyrinth in ancient Crete. Uh, that is not a compliment to the state of the law. Uh, there's a famous agency quote from the Washington Post where the official spokesperson for the Department of Homeland Security, at the time it was the INS, but she went on to become a spokesperson for Homeland Security as well. She said on the record in the Washington Post that immigration law is a mystery and a mastery of obfuscation. <laughs> uh, that was, of course, coming from the agency that's supposed to be enforcing the law. Uh, there's a law professor at Boston College, Laura Murray, who recently wrote a column, Raise Your Hand If You Understand Immigration Law, and in the column, she lists all the federal court cases where the judges have messed up immigration law. And I have another one to add to the list. Uh, last week's decision in Coelar de Osorio, unfortunately, the plurality opinion written by the former dean at Harvard Law School contains some egregious errors of immigration law, which we've been discussing on the Immigration Lawyers Listserv. So um, this is an area of the law that is extraordinarily difficult to master. Uh, you really have to practice in the area for a very long period of time to understand it. And I think uh, when I was a student here at Harvard Law School, I got a taste of it uh, in, my, in my class. It frankly scared me, Debbie, when I was in your class. I thought it was a lot worse than tax law. I was taking tax law from Al Warren, and I thought I understood that stuff really well. But immigration law made my brain hurt. And then look what happened, you know. 30 years later, I am one. Um, so my first taste of it came through the clinic, and I'm sure that it, if I had not gone to the clinic and, and taken your class here at Harvard Law School, I definitely would not be a MacArthur Fellow today, because that was the place where I got that grounding in the passion and the reason that, that is immigration law. I'm not going to bore you with repeating the story of the MacArthur Award, because it's in the Harvard Law Bulletin this month, uh, and I think everybody is enjoying their copy of that, because they mailed one out to, I think, everyone who who's here at the meeting today. Uh, but I did want to go over um, a little bit about what I learned from the clinic experience that probably contributed to me being a MacArthur Fellow or selected as a MacArthur Fellow. Uh, first, I did learn that immigration law is extraordinarily complicated, and you really have to devote yourself to it all the time to be good at it. It can't be something that you dabble in. Uh, I learned that you can bring about change because I saw Debbie doing it one case at a time, uh, you can change the law over time by concentrating on one case at a time and fixing one family's problems, and that'll eventually lead to fixing other people's problems. And that gives me hope for the future because we all know the legal immigration system is completely broken right now and Congress is dithering. But there are places where people, individual people, can have an impact and can make a change on the system. And then finally, I learned that one can be both reasoned and passionate about immigration law, and that is, in fact, the most uh, effective way to make change. Now, I did tell you to go read the bulletin if you want to hear about the MacArthur thing, but I feel like in the last five minutes I have to very quickly um, go over the reasons why the MacArthur Foundation awarded me this very prestigious and somewhat overwhelming fellowship, uh, just, just because part of my duties as a fellow are to tell people about the program so that hopefully somebody in the room here can become inspired to be a fellow eventually someday. Uh, so there were four things the MacArthur Foundation cited that I had done that deserved uh, recognition with the MacArthur Fellowship. 
The first thing was a body of theoretical work, meaning papers and books that I had written, which I personally didn't think were that exciting, but apparently some people were reading them. And the main argument in those books was that our immigration system had aired after 9-11, and we had started focusing solely on keeping people out of the United States, and we had stopped focusing on what made us a superpower, which is letting the right people into the United States. And we needed to return our thoughts on national security back to the idea that it's about letting the right people in. It's not about just keeping people out. So then there were three practical things that I did uh, that are probably the more exciting things to me. Uh, first one was something that my um, Bernie mentioned, military accessions vital to the national interest, and the dean also mentioned it, known by the Pentagon acronym MAVNI. This is a program whereby young people who are on the slow track to green cards, as every immigration lawyer knows, it takes maybe 15 years for a Harvard grad to get a green card these days. These folks can join the United States military and get citizenship in about 10 weeks. So it's a highly accelerated path to citizenship, and we have had Harvard and MIT graduates who are from foreign countries joining the United States Army, bringing their talents to the United States Army, and in return for that, they go from being a non-immigrant uh, to being a United States citizen in about 10 weeks, which is a remarkable thing. And it's been my great professional honor to think of that program and to work on it and be responsible for implementing it successfully at the Pentagon. I uh, really enjoyed that. And I re just so you know, Haitian TPS people can do this too. I know. <laughs> okay. So if you got anybody who's interested in military service, let me know. Um, the second thing was basic training naturalization, which is a program to naturalize foreigners who serve in the United States military at their basic training sites. And then the last thing was the American Immigration Lawyers Association Military Assistance Program, which is a program that matches pro bono lawyers who want to volunteer to help military families. Um, they match, they're matched with the military families to work on their immigration cases, and we've helped hundreds of people. And I know your firm has volunteered for cases, and so has Bernie's. Uh, so it's been really wonderful. I have a sense that it's a very, very rare thing as a lawyer in most fields of law for lawyers to feel that they're actually changing the world with their daily work. But if there's one field where you really get the impression that you are changing the world with your daily work, it's immigration law. And I think that's one of the things that really draws people to the field. Um, every case that we handle, every time we handle a case in the immigration field, uh, we feel that we're changing the world. Whether it's saving an individual family from poverty, stopping the government from deporting the breadwinner in the family so that the family will end up in poverty, whether it's saving a refugee from being returned to a land of conflict, or even if it's keeping a really talented MIT or Harvard graduate in the country to run a company, a startup company, and hire a bunch of Americans to have jobs uh, in that company, we do feel like we're changing the world. We get thank you letters every day from our clients, and I know the immigration lawyers in the room have all gotten these letters. They start with, you saved my life, you know, you saved my family. Uh, most lawyers who practice in most fields out there don't get those kinds of letters on a daily basis, but we immigration lawyers get them. Uh, and I really, I still remember the first case that I handled at the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinic. It was this complicated tangle with an Ethiopian a family, and I was working with Kennedy's office and you know, going to family court in Somerville, trying to sort the whole thing out, a complex mess. But the best thing for me as a law student was the family coming to me and saying thank you because you know, they figured out that I was the one that had helped them sort things out. Um, so in closing, I want to say that um, 30 years of the clinic have not only resulted in one or two MacArthur fellows, but a generation of Harvard Law School graduates who know that Aristotle was wrong. Law is both reason and passion. And if you bring both of those qualities to bear, both of which have been epitomized in the work of Deb Yanker, Nancy Kelly, John Wilshire, um, you will change the world. So thank you. Uh, it's intimidating following a panel where uh, Someone's just been declared a genius, which all of us knew well before it was official um, in that. And uh, it, it, in my clinic library, we have a, a fairly well-endowed clinic library with immigration resources and a wall of immigration resources. Um, several years ago, a student wrote a large lettered sign that says, Kurzban is your friend, and tacked it up on the <laughs> shelf. Um, 
and, and that has stayed there because we thought that was appropriate as a starting point for almost every form of, of research we do um, runs through through the work of Ira Kurzban. So I, I want you to know the whole panel has been paid to promote <laughs> the next edition of my book. Thank you. Yes, well, we, we all have it anyway, so no one else here is going to buy another copy, right? So um, <clears throat> can't sell anymore. Um, so I... I was in Debbie's clinic and, and worked with John and, and Nancy in 1993. Um, and that was a, a fairly heady time for the clinic, I think, in many ways. There was, uh, as, as Ira has talked about, uh, an influx of, of Haitian refugees and cases were filtering through the court systems. And they were working their way up um, in many ways into lofty uh, forms where, where the uh, Courts were deciding uh, issues, and, and law was being sorted out. And um, in my time in the clinic, I worked on none of those cases. Um, didn't do any work re related to them at all. Um, but I did have a client from Haiti um, who, who was very important in, in shaping my life in, in terms of where I've gone professionally and, and thinking about what I have done with, with my career. And, and this is a woman who had come prior to things exploding in Haiti, and, and she was on a path here toward uh, naturalization. She had uh, got her green card, her lawful permanent resident status, and she had a, a pending application for naturalization. The issue for her was that she had a child who had been left behind in Haiti, who had been smuggled in afterwards, who didn't have any papers. And so we had this disconnect between a woman who had uh, you know, the path toward naturalization and citizenship and all, all steam ahead, and a child who was nowhere to be found in our system and, and had, uh, you know, all kinds of problems based on how she'd entered and, and where she went. And that disconnect between family members is something that's informed my work. I, I think it's been uh, a great tribute to the work of, of the clinic here um, that there's been a, a range of cases. And, and I think that's what I think of when I think of my time in the clinic and, and, and how that shaped me, I don't think about the big cases. We could, we could do a list, right? We can think about all the amicus briefs that have been filed, all the, uh, the clients have been represented, all the circuit decisions that come down. Truly, the, the immigration clinic has uh, been key in shaping asylum law in particular, but, but also you know, many, many issues around detention, around uh, gender in our system and thinking about ways in which the, the clinic has, has shaped these ideas. But you know, for me, it comes back to the idea that, that this all starts with clients. This all starts with cases that aren't when you walk in really sexy, big, you know, this is the case that's gonna take you to the Supreme Court. This is the vehicle, right? When I was later out in practice uh, and, and in a public interest fellowship, I recall getting a phone call from a national advocacy group that said, we're just about ready to file to, to you know, put uh, a particular state's uh, foster care system into receivership because you know, they're not serving kids. You know, we've got all our papers, we're all ready, we're all set to go, we just need some clients. Can you help us find some clients? Um, that's not this clinic. That's not the, the model that's been followed where uh, causes drove cases. Um, clients drove cases, needs drove cases. And, and I think in terms of the generations of lawyers that have come out of this clinic and, and worked, that message, that idea that, that individual cases are, are what are important, serving individual clients is what is important, is really central and key to what's going on. Um, I flash forward ahead. Um, I, I think one of the reasons, you know, out of all the, the people who, who are out here who would do a better job of being on this panel than me, one of the reasons I'm here, Debbie reminded me this morning, is that uh, I once told her, I want a job like yours, right? Which at the time probably seemed, you know, as, as we honor Debbie, you know, and, and today and we celebrate 30 years, um, that seems fairly natural, right? Who wouldn't want this job, right? This is, this is great. Well, the jury was still out maybe back in 1993, right? Um, clinical education wasn't as prominent as it is now. It, wasn't, it didn't have the support. We wouldn't have had the dean sitting in the front row um, 30 years ago and, and had that support. Uh, immigration law was not as prominent in the academy 
as it is now, most major law schools didn't have a full-time person teaching immigration law in-house. And so we've come a long way. Um, and so, you know, as I look at, at the clinic and what about the clinic made me say, this is the work I want to do, it was that sense of connection, right? We talked, everyone's mentioned passion. I, my, my favorite quote is from, from Bonhoeffer, who says, the place to which you are called is where your great passion and the world's great need meet. And, and that's a clinic. It's a place where you look at need and you look at passion and you say, this is a place to pull it together. Now, as we look at things today, um, what's our, our Haitian flow of, of immigrants to the country right now? And, and I'll make the pitch that right now we should be looking at all the children that are coming to this country and being detained. This year, um, fiscal year uh, 2013, we've already had uh, 47,000 unaccompanied minors come and be detained in this country. We're on a pace for 60,000. This is a Mario boat lift of kids coming, walking across Mexico, trains, being detained um, in systems that aren't ready to handle them. Similar to what we've thought about and heard about the unsettled nature of, of refugee law when we had an influx of, of people from Haiti. The law wasn't ready to look at their situations and their need and respond in a way that made sense and that made uh, a, a connection between what was really going on, what was causing this flow of people, what was that, that great humanitarian crisis, and what's happening with our law and what we can do to respond and how we can provide relief and how we should be working. Well, we're that way with kids right now. We've got 60,000 kids. We've got various forms of relief that are available, none of which precisely in many cases fit the types of things that we would like to see happen for kids and for their families. This doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Many of these kids are coming looking for family here. We've got, in addition to that 60,000 coming now, we've got a million kids without papers in the United States living here as we speak, right? About one out of 10 or, or more of our, our you know, undocumented population in the United States are kids. We've got families where we've got kids with status, parents without status. We've got about 9 million people in this country living with some close family member who's undocumented, which means we've got families that are unstable and, and, and not threatened. And these are challenges for us to think as clinics here and, and elsewhere responded to the Haitian crisis. You know, here's another place. And, and this is one of many, right? There's lots of good work to be done with immigrants, but thinking about ways in which our legal systems don't match up well and don't line up well with the, with the needs of the people that uh, we have out there. Now, these are particularly good cases for clinics because they're challenging, they're hard, they require that mix of passion and advocacy and real clients, but scholarship as well, and, and thinking about different places and, and being a little bit fearless as to where we go for relief. Um, we tend to be very siloed in immigration law. Immigration practitioners like to go to immigration court and like to file things in, in federal systems. Well, many of our forms of relief are gonna involve being in state courts and going to other places. We've seen the expansion of immigration law on the criminal front and that crossover being widely recognized. So we have major projects going on around the country to train lawyers in state courts around criminal issues, well, family's gonna be there too because we've got these families that are divided across borders and we have different ways in which we really need to uh, pull this together and think about it and, and clinics, and this clinic in particular, um, are one of the resources for doing that. So I come back to uh, um, saying, you know, I want a job like Debbie's, uh, it's a great job. Um, it's a great job, and you know, one of the, the things that, uh, that tells us that is that you know, this team here of, of you know, Nancy and, and John and, and Debbie has stayed together for so long and, and worked so well, and um, you know, really are role models for, for many people. And, and you know, as I look out on this room, I see you know, I, I co-direct a, a clinic with my wife, which you know, is role modeling in more than one ways, right, with this group. So, um, 
but I look out and I, you know, I see Becky and, and Rogany and, and other folks who, you know, run their, their clinics. And I think, you know, the legacy of, of this clinic is, is not just to our clients, um, but to the many other clinics that are out there that, that serve clients in, in similar ways and, and the, the expansion of, of that in legal education and the role. And um, it really all comes back to, you know, this. So, so for me, the legacy of, you know, 30 years of this clinic is not just looking backwards at what's been done, but sort of what's been launched and, and where we're all headed. Well, uh, folks, that um, ends uh, this part of our panel. There's uh, one of my mentors, Harvey Kaplan. Hi, Harvey. Uh, it's good to see uh, so many um, friends. Um, you know, David, your, uh, your mention of the uh, plight of unaccompanied uh, children um, just cannot be overemphasized. I had a case just... Uh, Oh, about three weeks ago of an unaccompanied minor from El Salvador that uh, was um, um, being held in one of the um, for-profit prisons, uh, albeit a children's prison, and it happened to be a Saturday, and I demanded to speak to the person in charge, and uh, they said to me that um, there's nobody in charge, it's a weekend, we're closed. And I said to me, no. There's no such thing as a prison being closed. You are holding my client, and I demand to see. I, I actually lost my temper uh, because I'd given my story about um, South Africa, but even in South Africa, the prisons were not closed on Saturday. People were held in detention, and here we are in America in a private for-profit, and um, you know, I kind of, I just lost it. I, I, I couldn't believe that they were giving me this runaround that there was nobody in charge because it was a weekend and uh, the uh, supervisor was not available. Um, um, fortunately, they did release uh, my kid because I, um, I used the old line, I'm not gonna sue the government, I'm gonna sue you personally. <laughs> that's, that's, I don't wanna care about the government, it's you. And uh, that one worked. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I don't, I'm not very good at suing. I would have probably had to call Ira to help me. Uh, but I guess we shouldn't be making threats we can't carry through without. Uh, uh, but uh, in this one, I was determined to make it. Uh, in, you know, honoring Debbie and, and, and uh, John and, and Nancy for all their great work, um, it suddenly made me think that there were two names um, that inspired me uh, going through law school that I needed to honor. And um, one was my political science professor, Rick Turner, um, who perhaps is more responsible for change than will ever be acknowledged. Rick was a PhD, Subban, 70s. Uh, and um, he was shot by a security police um, through his front door when he answered the door and bled to death in his teenage daughter's arms. And um, I will always revere Rick and his red flaming hair and the inspiration that he gave to all of us uh, to fight against injustice. And my con law professor, who was a family friend, Ray Sutner, who <coughs> handed out some pamphlets uh, release Mandela pamphlets, pro ANC pamphlets, and he was blindfolded and tortured and um, spent 10 years in solitary confinement and this young Oxford graduate who you know, came out of prison, an old gray-haired man. Um, it just some of the inspiring figures that, that, um, that uh, influenced me in my youth. Um, and you know, Debbie, I know you've inspired so many and um, you know uh, I, I know that the battle uh, will be won uh, it just has to be fought on a daily basis um, so we're going to move over to the uh, question and hopefully uh, these uh, inspired folks will um, uh, give us the answers um, you know 
one of the things I had to mention, because we were talking about paying for this building, um, you know, the McCarthy Award that, uh, that, that she got, you know, it's uh, expecting a new suit there. It's $500,000 $500, with no, no strings. No, Bernie, you got it wrong. I knew I was going to make trouble. $625,000. $612,000. <laughs> She is worth every penny but of they, it. They don't give it to you all at once. <laughs> Do they tax it? I mean, is yeah, it? it's taxable. It's, it's taxable. other income for all you tax wonks. Okay, got it. They don't but, give it to you all at once. It's paid out over five years, so I have not gotten rich. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, but certainly most deserved. So um, have to throw in a little humor here. Um, the um, question and answer. So we we. You know, my panel, I don't know if you want to start asking each other questions or we uh, accepting uh, questions from the floor, but uh, Ira, you're never short of words. Get started here. Well, no, I, actually, Margaret, I think you should Ma talk a little bit more about oh, the, the MAVNI program and, um, and how you did it, because I think it's really an inspiration to a lot of people. Um, she told me the... She told me the entire story off the record, and I can't ever repeat it, but, um, but you could certainly tell the official version of it. Well, when I told you the story, though, nobody knew about it. Now it's on the MacArthur Foundation <laughs> website, so. It's... And she was a little drunk, but I won't say. Whoa. <laughs> Too much information there. No, no. Actually, I wasn't, but I was just very happy that night. Uh, drunk with joy. Drunk with joy, right. No, I was enjoying telling you the story. Yeah, That's why I was great. having such a good time. Um, it's, it's a pretty involved story, but I'll give you the short version. And then if there's a particular aspect of <laughs> no, it that either. you want me to amplify. Uh, I had this unusual experience of I happened to be at a conference with uh, a whole pile, a couple hundred army people, and the conference was somewhat disorganized. And I was distressed by the disorganization. So I asked for an opportunity to speak to the crowd for five minutes. And the colonel in charge said, hey, whatever, OK. So at 1 o'clock, he said, Lieutenant Colonel Stock is going to get up and speak to everybody. And people were scratching their heads like, why? You know, We're all running around doing different things and not paying any attention to anybody. And so I got up at 1 o'clock, and the room got silent. And I gave this five-minute presentation on how I could solve all the Army's recruiting problems with a memo uh, allowing immigrants to enlist in the military, and I pointed out that the wartime authority already existed for this, so they didn't have to change any laws. All they had to do was write a memo. And this had apparently never occurred to anyone, so the room got really silent. And then they voted on this proposal, and they voted to present it to the general as a proposal uh, for fixing the Army's recruiting problems at the time. And just to give you context, it was a fall of 2007, and the Army at the time uh, was having colossal recruiting problems because the two wars were going on, the economy was booming, nobody was joining the military. And it was costing the taxpayers millions of dollars, literally. They were paying people $40,000 quick ship bonuses to sign up for the Army if you were willing to ship out to basic training right away. So the general got briefed on my idea, and he thought it was a really great idea. And so he said, Lieutenant Colonel Stock, you're a reserve officer. I'm going to put you on active duty until you get the Pentagon to sign this memo. <laughs> and I was rather alarmed by this. <laughs> so uh, I lived in Alaska at the time, and I had a family up there. And I called my, my spouse, who's a lawyer, with no military background. And I said to him, you know, honey, they're putting me on active duty for until I get this thing done. You know, how long do you think it'll take? And he, and he goes, well, two weeks. It's just a memo. You know, you'll be off active duty in two weeks. And I said, well, you don't know the military. <laughs> so then I called this other friend of mine, and I actually flew to D.C., and I briefed him. And he used to be the secretary of one of the services, but I'm not going to say his name because I don't have his permission. Um, and he's a Yale grad. <clears throat> and I went to him, and I said, You've got a lot of experience with the Pentagon. Here's my idea. How long do you think it's going to take me to get this through the Pentagon? He looked at me gravely, and he said, Margaret, the Pentagon crushes great ideas. <laughs> he said, I don't think this is going to get through the Pentagon, but if it does, it'll take you five years. <laughs> so I had the two-week estimate and the five-year estimate. And the short version is I, I went on part-time active duty January 2008, and the Secretary of the Army signed off on the idea in May 2008, so it was less than five months later. Yeah. Yeah. And then Secretary of Defense Robert Gates liked the idea so much that he decided to apply it to all the services, not just the Army, 
and he signed a memo in November 2008 uh, authorizing the program. So I thought I was done, but then they said, no, you did such a great idea, great job getting this thing through the Pentagon in less than a year, now you're in charge of the program. <laughs> so you're gonna be running it and implementing it until your retirement date. And luckily I knew what my retirement date was because I had, you know, as a reserve officer, when you get commissioned, they tell you exactly 28 years later is your retirement date. So I knew what that day was. <laughs> and sure enough, uh, my retirement date came. <clears throat> I will tell you one last story because it's funny. The date of my retirement, I was up at West Point and I thought I was done with the Army forever. I'm going back to Alaska. I can be with my family, you know, and all that. And they threw a big ceremony at West Point. They flew a flag. They gave me a certificate signed by Barack Obama. We had punch and cake and speeches and medals. And then I got back to the office and there was an email from the Pentagon and it said, you are being retained on active duty for a period of three years, commencing on the date of your retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it turned out that that was illegal. They couldn't do that. Great. A great story. Okay. Well, top that. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Yeah, we have a question from Harvey Kaplan in the back. Right, well, I think there are some biographical details you may not know. Um, I'm a, actually a card-carrying member of the Federalist Society. Yeah, and I'm a, a member of the Republican Party. But I'm from Alaska. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't worry, I'll represent you. And, um, <laughs> and I was a military police officer. So in addition to being an immigration lawyer in civilian life, I had probably a fairly sophisticated knowledge of the military from having served for a very long period of time, having worked as a faculty member at the United States Military Academy and Army War College, Command and General Staff College. I've been teaching for years. Uh, one of the things that I think people may not appreciate is that change from the inside does require knowledge of an organization. You know, you can't make a ship turn if you don't know how the engines run. And one of the things that I found was that you know, getting this MAVNI project through the Pentagon required all that educational background. I had, I'd been an undergraduate at Harvard. I was a math and economics major for a while, and then political science. Joe Nye was one of my mentors. Um, James Q. Wilson, who wrote a book called Bureaucracy that I still remember as an undergraduate, had taught me all about, when I was an undergraduate, he was one of my professors, and he taught me how bureaucracies worked which was absolutely critical to getting the MAVNI program through. And Ira, I you know, entertained him one night at the ALA conference for a couple hours with these bureaucratic stories, but you really, to get things done inside, you have to know how the agency works. You have to know the agency culture, and that's not something you can get if you've never worked inside an agency, if you're you know, um, somebody who just got appointed by the president and just doesn't know anything, and you come in and you're, you know, a political appointee, you're just not gonna get anything done because you're not gonna know how to push those levers. Uh, one of my famous bureaucratic sayings that I did not make up, um, I think it's very old, and I think Colin Powell's the person that, that first um, told me this. There's a famous saying, you get what you measure. And, that is absolutely true. You can move the ship of state if you figure out what the measuring criteria are on the ground. Um, example, I was a police officer, right? If you rate the police officers by how many parking tickets they write, you are going to get a lot of parking tickets, right? And it doesn't matter what the police chief says is the philosophy of the organization if the people on the ground are being rated by the number of parking tickets they write. So with a large agency like the Department of Homeland Security, if you wanna get change, you need to be looking at how the, the agency works, you need to be looking on the ground at how people are rated, 
You know, the lawyer's behavior in court depends on how they are rated, how they're promoted. Um, if you have quotas for people to be deported, you're going to get a lot of people deported. You know, that's just a fact. And I think oftentimes in government, people forget how things actually work. You know, they have these ideals. People go out and make speeches and say, we're going to do X and we're going to do Y. The speech should be the end of the program. You know, you should have done all your prep work and your measurements and you're figuring out how things are going to work before the speech is given by the president announcing the program. That should be the last thing that happens, not the first thing. So, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of, um, I think, uh, insider knowledge that's necessary to get things done. And I, I was just extraordinarily fortunate that I had kind of a unique background in immigration law and a grounding in the military that allowed me to kind of see, you know, where things could happen in a realistic way. You know, I knew, I knew from immigration law, I'm not going to get Congress to change the law. That's just not going to happen. So what I need to do is use the existing law and figure out how to get the agency to use the existing law. And the MAVNI program, frankly, benefits the military tremendously. They're not trying to be progressive. Um, you know, it's, this is a situation where the military goes, gosh, you know, in World War I, 20% of the people serving in the army were immigrants, 20%. Why is it only 4% today? Well, it's a self-inflicted wound because basically the military made some dumb changes to policy where they, for example, restricted recruitment to people who had green cards, not realizing that you can't get a green card anymore. You know, it's impossible for people to get a green card until they're 35 or 40 and they're too, you're, they're too old to join the military at that point. So they had cut, up, cut off their recruiting supply and they were losing access to highly talented people. We're fighting a global war on terrorism 9-11 happened because we couldn't understand the intercepts that the National Security Agency had picked up. You know, they had piles and piles of electronic intercepts that hadn't been translated because nobody spoke the languages. So it was in the military's self-interest. I know it sounds really progressive, Harvey, but you know, the, the way you pitch programs to agencies is you point out that they're going to save a lot of money and they're going to be able to accomplish their core mission if they do. Um, what, what you're suggesting they do. And, and that was true with the MAVNI program. The military saved literally millions of dollars by implementing that program. They got a pool of highly talented people. Um, they got the so soldier of the year for the US Army, a Gurkha from Nepal, you know, um, just one example. They got an MIT guy with two, P two master's degrees from MIT in nuclear technology and nuclear policy. He's now a US citizen serving in the Army. Uh, they got Harvard graduates, Stanford graduates, you know, you name it. Lots of very, very sharp people. And they would never have gotten these people. So I'll just throw out one statistic to, to impress you. Um, the first year we ran the MAVNI program, the Army Reserve was extraordinarily short healthcare professionals. And the MAVNI program filled 47% of the vacancies in dentists in the Army Reserve. Now, you know, that's that's a huge impact to fill 47% of the vacancies with a really tiny program. And of course, soldiers can't deploy if they have bad teeth, you know. And lots of Americans join the military with bad teeth, and they, you know, they're not deployable until the dentists fix their teeth. So this may sound like a little thing, but the, the impact was tremendous. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Margaret is, uh, um, I think, somewhat modest, because there's, there's two other ingredients to her success. Um, the first, well, uh, just a key one is, is grit. Uh, Margaret has a lot of grit, and Margaret is a very, very determined person, and, um, you know, what she's left out of that, um, which I'm personally aware of, uh, are the spears and arrows that she, she got uh, along the way and uh, fought valiantly, which she won't talk about, but when I was um, AILA president, uh, and she didn't ask me, I volunteered, but I remember sending uh, a letter or email or whatever it was um, supporting her. Uh, in many instances, you know, she was fighting this battle alone. And I, I, she hasn't spoken about opponents and challenges, but uh, it wasn't that easy uh, well, to do know, what she did. Can I just add something there? I, I want to throw a shout out. Stephen Legomsky's here, and he was working at USCS. And one thing I want to say is, I got a huge amount of support from DHS in this program. Um, in fact, it was amazing to me the number of people who would call up from USCIS, Customs and Border Protection, and even ICE 
to try to help with the program. You know, ICE, which you normally think of as Immigration Customs Enforcement, don't they deport people? They were integral to getting the MAVNI program through, and I spent a huge amount of time coordinating with them, you know, helping them with memos, um, editing memos that they were coming up with to help implement the program. Uh, USCIS was enormously helpful in getting the program through, you know, with basic training, naturalization. Um, and so one of the things I definitely appreciated was you, you didn't have to, I didn't have to just know the Pentagon. I had to know like the people at all these different agencies and get them to, to help me out. And I, I'm sort of getting all the recognition for this stuff, but it really was a team effort with a whole lot of people involved. Um, you can't get a program through the Pentagon if you're just one person in less than a year. I mean, it just doesn't happen. You have allies, you have you know, people that are helping you out. People got me into briefings with high-ranking officials. Um, people, you know, helped me with advocacy work at different agencies and so forth. Um, so there was a lot of work. But I'll tell you one really quick funny anecdote. I got a call from an ICE agent. He was trying to deport a guy from the Middle East, and he called me up and he said, you know, this guy would be a great Army soldier. Can we get him into your program? And I said, well, aren't you guys trying to deport him? And he goes, well, you know, we have to do that, you know, but he would, he would be a really good soldier, you know. Folks, uh, we're taking questions um, from the floor. I don't want to have to pry to Ira to give uh, his follow-up. Um, Ira? Well, let, let me just say uh, one thing um, to follow up what Margaret was saying. Uh, I've had, I'm not sure it's good fortune, but uh, I have... Uh, begun over the last five, ten years to represent a lot of employees in the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, one of the things I learned, of course, is that they're treated as poorly uh, sometimes as um, uh, our clients are treated. Um, but uh, what Margaret said is absolutely true. If you really want to get something through um, an agency like the Department of Homeland Security or any of its subparts, you really have to understand how they think about issues, how they think about dealing with problems. And one of the things I learned in representing um, a number of these people is really kind of how the agency internally operates uh, and what kind of pushes their buttons one way or another. Um, so it's a very valuable lesson and I think uh, I think many of us who are liberal um, kind of discounted and, you know, we see them as the enemy and kind of, and they see us as the enemy. Uh, and I think it's, uh, as is typical of human nature, it's far more complex than that. Um, and it's been a, an educational experience for me to be able to represent individuals within the agency because it's taught me an awful lot about the agency itself. Thank you. Um, again, we're inviting questions uh, to our panelists or generally. Uh, um, David, uh, I don't want to leave you out of uh, the uh, front line here if you've uh, got anything to add or query. No, I, I think we're standing well. There's a question from the back. Sorry, sir. The, the name is? Martin. Martin. Sure. Uh, the program expires on September 30th of this year, uh, and the politics of it within the Pentagon are a little bit complicated, but they, um, there was a little bit of a problem a few weeks ago when some Pentagon officials presented an option for the DREAM Act people, the DACAs, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, to be allowed to enlist in the military. And these Pentagon officials presented Chuck Cagle, the Secretary of Defense, with only one option, uh, which is not proper staff work. You know, they're supposed to present the Secretary with a lot of different options. But they told Secretary Hagel that the only option for recruiting the DREAM Act, the DACA people, was to put them in the MAVNI program. Unfortunately, none of the DREAM Act people qualify for the MAVNI program. So putting them into the MAVNI program was basically going to lead to a lot of disappointment because these young people would suddenly think they were eligible for military service, but then they'd show up at the recruiter and the recruiter would say, well, you can get into the military, but only if you qualify for the MAVNI program and you can't qualify for the MAVNI program, so have a nice day. Uh, and that was the only option that the Pentagon officials presented to the Secretary of Defense. So the White House intervened and halted the attempt by the Pentagon to announce that 
the Dreamers were going to be allowed into the military, but only if they qualified for the Mavni program. When the White House did that, the Pentagon people took that as an instruction to put the Mavni program on hold. Uh, it was due to be renewed on September 30th, and right now it's basically on hold because they haven't figured out at the Pentagon that the White House probably does want them to renew the program, and I expect eventually that'll get sorted out and they'll renew the program. However, they don't have anybody up at the Pentagon who understands any of these immigration issues right now, so um, it might take them a while. The last time they halted the Mavni program under the Obama administration, it took two years to get it up and running again. Um, and, you know, obviously very disappointing to me because I see all these talented people who are lined up trying to get in and they get told, you're on hold because the bureaucrats can't sort things out and we don't know when you're going to be allowed to, you know, join the military. And we do have, um, they've got a limited quota for the program right now, it's 1500 a year. They were talking about increasing it because they really need these individuals, so there was a proposal to, in, to up the number substantially. That's on hold right now. Um, and. Uh, you know, obviously, as somebody interested in America's national security and getting the most talented people to work for the government that could possibly be recruited, I find it disappointing that we can't get these, these programs through. Because to me, it looks blazingly simple, right? We did it before. We should be able to just sign the memo and do it again, right? But that's not quite how things are working at the moment. So maybe as a result of me speaking today, some White House official will tell the Pentagon to you know, renew the program. I just want to point out on, you know, one of the things that, that talking about this brings to bear is, is thinking about scale. Um, 1,500 um, is not that many when we look at the, the big numbers we're talking about. You know, DACA eligible, um, you know, population is, is estimated to be around 1.7 million. Um, and so, you know, just the, the, the you know, the factors of, uh, you know, scale there are, are enormous. So as we think about how some of these programs work and how they're going to work going forward, you know, part of our imagination has to be to think about big numbers. If we're going to say, you know, uh, I don't know, what, what's the size of our military force in total right now? Well, there's over 1.5 million people total right. if you're looking at everything. Right. You know, but, you know, so, Guard and Reserve. so, you know, we could right. we could double that by, by throwing every DACA or saying every DACA has mm -hmm. to somehow, you know, go, go you know, not that not that 1.7 million have applied and been approved for DACA, but you know, the, the scale of what we're talking about here is, is enormous. And so um, thinking about the ways these programs inter interact, you know, often sounds easy at the beginning. And then when we look at, at you know, how many people could actually get into some of these programs and, and how many could, you know, meet all the other qualifications that the military or, or another program are going to require, right, in terms of education and background and, and um, you know, uh, fitness and, and other things that all of a sudden that population dwindles and in significant ways. Right, and I know I'm out of time, but just to add a little bit of advocacy about some of the legislative proposals that you've been hearing about, there's two bills on the Hill right now that make what you're saying extraordinarily important to understand. One of them is a Jeff Denham bill called the Enlist Act. Uh, it's been getting all the press. Jeff Denham is a Republican from California. He th says the DACA should be allowed to enlist. If you read his bill, it's a terrible bill. It would let maybe 800 people join the military every year, at most. Badly drafted, uh, whoever wrote the legislative li language in the bill needs to go back to law school and learn how to do legislative mm -hmm. drafting again. It's just poorly, poorly drafted bill. And Mr. Denham doesn't really understand what his bill does. But he has a tremendous number of co-sponsors and he's been getting a huge amount of press on the bill. There's another bill that was introduced before Mr. Denham's bill that actually was introduced by a Tea Party Republican that is a beautiful bill perfectly drafted, easy to implement, doesn't cost anything, would let every single DACA who's got a work permit join any kind of military component, including the Coast Guard Reserve, and get their citizenship. That bill would probably let about 10,000 people become American citizens every year, but it's gotten absolutely no press, hardly any co-sponsors. People don't know about it, even though it's you know, much better drafted bill. And the one that's going to let 800 people, you know, get their citizenship is getting all the press, the one that would get 10,000. Um, somebody also was giving me credit for PIP, and Stephen Legomsky actually should get credit for the Parole in Place program. Um, he was the counsel for USCIS when the memo, the famous memo came out. 
Um, but um, if you combine MAVNI, DACA enlistment, and the PIP program, you have a huge impact if you look at the numbers that, that would flow through the system and the number of people who would be able to get some kind of permanent status. So, you know, these are the things I think people really need to think about. You know, the vision is really wonderful, but how it gets implemented on the ground is critical. And legislative language is crucial. People need to run that language by experts who can tell you what exactly is going to come out at the other end of the sausage machine, you know, when you start throwing this stuff in. So I think your point's a really critical one. We uh, pretty much out of time, but there was one last question I'd like to take. Um, Ira, you want a shot at that? Well, uh, gee, that's a, that's, that's a question I think the President of the United States is grappling with right now. Um, you know, numbers uh, in immigration to me are, uh, have always fascinated me. For example, most Americans don't know that President Johnson decided to fly 266,000 Cubans into the United States at one shot from the Puerto Camarioca in 1966. Nobody thought it was the end of the world, you know. Um, so, you know, the numbers game is kind of an interesting issue, and it's getting blown up now. You know, they're talking about 60,000, and they're saying there's going to be another 100,000 people. Well, we have the capacity, uh, clearly, to handle hundreds of thousands of people if we have the political will to do it. That doesn't mean that we have open borders. It means that we realistically have to deal with whatever the the issue is, this is a, a very tough issue of kids coming into the United States. I think we do not want to be a country that says we're turning kids back at the border, obviously. So, um, you know, what they're trying to do, and I think Vice President Biden's trying to do now is, you know, he's going to Guatemala, they're going to Central American countries, and uh, having represented a small Caribbean country, I know how the United States can put extreme pressure on other countries to try and get things done. So my guess is that, you know, that flow of people will probably slow down significantly. Um, the other question is a much bigger one. You know, uh, when, when my students always ask me, uh, you know, this question, which is really who do we want in the United States and why don't we have skilled people, and that's always the debate. Do we have skilled people coming in who have uh, um, high degrees of education versus refugees coming in? And, you know, I always um, uh, tell them one word, Google, um, because, you know, the, the uh, co-owner of Google was a, a child of a refugee. He didn't come in as a skilled PhD professional. So you never know. I mean, this man standing here to me is the perfect example. He was the president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. He's one of the preeminent immigration lawyers in America. And uh, he came here as a refugee. So how do you determine that question? It's a very, very difficult issue. And it's one that we could probably sit here and discuss for the next three or four years. With well, any <laughs> well, we are out of time, but um, you know, getting into immigration policy uh, it's it's you know we're all lawyers and and it's a balancing it's a balancing test as always and it's a balance between family immigration um, the best and the brightest employment immigration and America's strong history of admitting refugee and asylees and uh, we have a system in place uh, which currently uh, does provide priority to family, uh, the only problem is the waiting lines have gone so long 
that you know you could be 70 or 80 years uh, old by the time you get to immigrate and re uh, you know uh, reunite with your family. So uh, the problem is that uh, immigration reform is stalled. Uh, and uh, hopefully Congress will get its act together, look at these issues, we'll have an opportunity uh, to participate, to advocate. Uh, this is the time uh, to fix these laws. Uh, basically, the uh, Immigration Act of 1990, you know, it's, it's what, over 25 years now uh, since there's been any uh, significant immigration reform, and the time is now to change this and fix the mess that we have. So thank you, everybody. It's been a real pleasure and an honor to be here today to honor uh, this amazing group. Thank you so much.